Department of Defense weapon systems have many costs contributing to their sustainment, with maintenance comprising a major portion of total ownership cost. On one side, maintenance leads to inflated costs and removes vehicles from operations unnecessarily. While on the other side of the spectrum, scaling down maintenance activities to reduce cost could lead to unexpected equipment failure followed by lengthy triage and repair time. In some cases, these unexpected repairs occur in less than ideal environments with very limited access to platform experts or other maintenance resources. The DOD's maintenance system operates primarily on time-based or reactive maintenance and is struggling to implement preventive and predictive maintenance technologies. Ultimately, there's a fine balance to achieve when efficiently maintaining fleet operations without increasing costs and downtime for critical missions. In this show, Mitch Plonsky and Mike Wiegand discuss how system operators and military commanders have a need for comprehensive analysis of their fleet's data in real time to predict maintenance requirements. Mitch Plonsky is the VP of Operations and Federal at Shift 5. Prior to Shift 5, he was assigned to the Office of Director of National Intelligence, where he served in numerous operations and management roles, including the Executive Officer to the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Strategy and Engagement and Special Intelligence Coordinator. Mike Wiegand is a co-founder and chief growth officer at Shift 5. Prior to Shift 5, Michael served eight years in the U.S. Army as an Airborne Ranger Qualified Infantry Officer and was selected as one of the first cyber operations officers. Mitch, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Josh. Yeah, well, this is a really exciting topic because I know uh, all three of us have spent a lot of time around military weapon systems uh, in the Army and out. Uh, and if we know one thing, it's that there are maintenance problems with these things. These are really complicated, um, you know, multi-subsystem, um, expensive assets with a lot of parts, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and when those things break, the entire machine becomes inoperable. And so something I know you and I, Mike, spent a lot of time on is uh, thinking about maintenance and making sure that uh, vehicles were, were up to up to snuff. Um but there's a different way that I think a lot of asset owners have started to maintain their operational technology assets and particularly fleet assets, and that's with predictive maintenance. So I think maybe we can start the show, Mike, with um, just a quick overview of what is predictive maintenance. Yeah, so predictive maintenance is figuring out uh, at its most basic like what's about to break so that you can swap things in and out before the actual system Uh, has to be taken out of operation for repairs. So uh, everything that's mechanical eventually, you know, succumbs to wear and tear, stress fatigues, uh, you know, you name it. There's a, there's a million and one reasons that, uh, you know, a mechanical system uh, would need to be, um, you know, pulled out of operational use, uh, cleaned, uh, have certain parts, uh, you know, repaired or replaced. And then, um, you know, reconfigured and then put back into operational use. The promise of predictive maintenance is, hey, how do we leverage data, uh, whether that's digital or was, uh, you know, collected from, uh, you know, analog means by like going back through all of these maintenance records and come up with uh, measures to identify what's going to fail when so that we can fix it before it actually becomes an operational problem. Mitch, why don't you just like run these things until they fail? I mean, it seems like, well, you don't have to do all this fancy predictive stuff if you just sort of, the machine's going to tell you when something breaks. Like what's the advantage of knowing ahead of time uh, that that something's about to fail? Yeah, absolutely, Josh. On the DoD side in particular, where we spend quite a bit of our time right now, um, you are constantly seeing uh, customers or end users, individuals who are operating the platforms, uh, increasingly looking for efficiency across their fleets of vehicles. And that is specifically based because of the operating tempo of many of these uh, individual units or organizations or fleet owners in particular. Uh, their schedule is demanding that they have a specific percentage of uptime or, or readiness avail- available in these fleets in order to perform in which their schedule is is dictating allowing. And just uh, the uh, events on the ground or across the globe as well, they're constantly deploying. Uh, at rates that arguably we've never seen in our country before. Therefore, requiring a, a specific amount of their fleet to be have a, a specific amount of percentage of readiness in order to perform in which they're being asked. 
Yeah, and I mean, I, you bring up a great point, which is that a lot of these actually military weapon systems are um, oftentimes largely repurposed commercial systems, right? And so, if you're if you're going to take a commercial asset that an OEM has designed with particular operating parameters, uh, or even you know um, a military weapon system that an OEM has designed with some set of op tempo in mind. Um, and you start pushing those to the limit, you're in kind of uncharted territory, right? And so, um, Mike, can you give me a sense of, I mean, you and I have been around a lot of broken military weapon systems. Um, give me a sense of like, number one, like how hard are these things to, to repair? And then number two, like how many um, parts when you have to replace things, like how many parts do you typically have on hand and what could data about what's about to break help you to get these systems back online and back into the fight uh, quicker? Yeah. So you're taking me back to my infantry days. I served at Fort Hood in, uh, in the first cavalry division, a really storied division. Uh, first cav has armored brigade combat teams. So uh, for the uninitiated, that means that they have a lot of tanks. They have a lot of Bradley fighting vehicles, just a tremendous amount of tracked heavy armor. Uh, it's really a cool place to kind of cut your teeth. If you're a gearhead, you're going to be right at home there. Uh, just a tremendous amount of firepower. Um, they really, uh, really enjoy blowing stuff up. So um, first, uh, the first thing that you know when you like go to Fort Hood is that Monday morning, nine o'clock, there's going to be thousands of soldiers in these motor pools, these parking lots where we keep all of our, uh, all of our vehicles parked. And they're going to do a formation and a check-in, make sure everybody's there. And then they're all going to go to their various vehicles and they're going to start doing predict, uh, preventative maintenance checks and services. They're going to check the oil pressure. They're going to check tire pressure. They're going to follow all of these procedures you know, for each of their vehicles to make sure that everything's uh, ready. Um, whenever they find things that are deficient, they're going to record that onto a piece of paper that gets reviewed a little bit later in the day and then put into a really uh, big and, and quite complex uh, defense uh, analysis system that allows everybody to kind of see what's broke and prioritize things. So some common things that uh, that would break for us when we were in the field um, are, uh, you know, sometimes obvious things like we'd have flat tires and, uh, you know, trank, uh, tanks. Uh, they have uh, little rubber tread devices. And over time, those the rubber tread wears away and you just have the uh, the uh, metal tread and that like completely tears up the road. So you want to you, know, you got to replace that periodically. So there's like obvious, simple stuff like that. Um, and, you know, usually units keep like uh, repair parts, uh, common stuff. They, they can maintain a certain stockpile of uh, repair stocks um, at various levels in, in uh, the unit um, hierarchy. Uh, and a lot of that is supposed to be driven, you know, by data and prior experience. But uh, sometimes uh, there are more complex repairs that are needed. Um, now, much like uh, the automotive industry, you know, uh, Army ground combat vehicles, whether they're wheeled or tracked, are designed around a sustainment plan. So they're designed to be easy to maintain in the field because the whole purpose of them is to be ready and available. So if they're damaged from enemy, you know, activity or uh, just wear and tear, you're supposed to be able to swap stuff in and out really quick and all the procedures are well documented. But there are certain repairs that are more complex than others. And I'll give you an example. There's a there's a, a cable that we colloquially just called the spaghetti cable in the Bradley fighting vehicle. This was the tank. Uh, this was like the infantry carrier. It looks like a mini tank. Um, there's an amazing movie on its production called Pentagon Wars uh, that everybody should watch. <laughs> um, I spent a couple years on this vehicle and I feel uh, really close to it. Um, but the spaghetti cable is the single cable that allows all of the computers on board to, to talk to one another. And if it gets like broken somehow, and some, sometimes it just breaks, I don't know how to explain how or why. Oh my gosh, you have to like rip everything apart because it jacks into everything. And uh, it takes like a four person team, sometimes days to like replace this. It's a huge mess. So uh, it turns out the uh, communications networks on fleet assets are pretty important. You, you might need all of the computers to talk to one another if you want to be able to like drive and shoot and communicate. So, <laughs> yeah, every I mean, there's an enormous amount of integration right going on under the hood. Um, so that's an example of, uh, of you know, I, I specifically remember like the spaghetti cable needing to be replaced on one of our vehicles. And um, we were actually 
uh, you know, at our base, um, what we call home station. So we were only working, you know, about six to eight hours a day in the motor pool. And it took us like a week and a half to get that replaced. It was a lot of work. Other things are, are relatively quick and easy, but um, it's, it spans the gamut, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's not just ground combat vehicles that suffer from these kinds of system availability issues, right? Um, Mitch, you and I were talking a while ago about like some of the numbers in the Air Force. Um, you know, there was a report that came out we were talking about. I don't know. Do you, could you uh, give us a sense of like just how bad the problem is there? Yeah, I think you're referencing a report that we've recently seen. Uh, it was in the Air Force Times, actually, in 2018, I believe, in which they looked at the military readiness of weapon systems across the Air Force alone. And uh, surprisingly, the readiness has decreased by over 8% between 2012 to 2018. Uh, it would be interesting to see the stats recently to see if that trend continued to grow. But it, I think it, it goes back to my earlier point, which is you've seen uh, nearly a decade plus of conflict and a demand on uh, these weapon systems. You know, some of these uh, being used going back into the 1980s and in some cases the 70s. And what does that mean in terms of availability and readiness going forward? Uh, it is a requirement to quickly understand when parts start to fail across these systems. What's interesting, and I would love to c- continue to have that conversation here, is uh, what these c- systems are communicating to us that, frankly, no one's listening. Uh, and the ability to understand ahead of time from a predictive or conditions-based based maintenance standpoint of uh, b- being able to read and collect and understand and translate that data ahead of time to preposition assets to increase the readiness level. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity here to leverage technology uh, in order to capture a lot of this data that's being generated. And again, frankly, no one's listening to it. Yeah, Mitch, it's an awesome point. I mean, I think, you know, Mike, something we've been saying for a decade now since we've been in, you know, Army Cyber Command talking about military weapon systems and their digital properties is exactly what Mitch is saying, which is, hey, um, for economic reasons, you've replaced so many of these analog components that are on these systems with digital ones. It just makes a ton of sense. They're faster, cheaper, more reliable, more robust, uh, more flexible. Um, But you haven't thought about this asset as a digital, a modern digital computer system. And so all of these sensors and actuators are generating like loads of data, um, but we're just not collecting it. And so, um, you know, I think something that uh, maybe you could touch on is this idea that we don't actually potentially need to really install new sensors and instrument all this different kind of stuff. We just are um, paying attention to the stuff that's already on these systems, right? Yeah. So back to my spaghetti cable story with the uh, with the Bradley. Um, you know, looking back, the crew noticed that uh, you know in the weeks and months before this thing just completely broke, it was operating a little bit funny or fishy. Now, a lot of weapon systems have uh, what are called built-in tests. So when different individual subsystems come online, they test themselves, make sure everything's good and green. They have self-diagnostic information, um, and that helps crews understand what's broke and helps the maintenance uh, uh, teams uh, assess uh, very quickly, you know, what needs to be fixed so they can get systems back up, you know, back in the fight, literally, uh, in many cases. So, uh, you know, looking back on that, when you have, like, intermittent issues, um, you know, People, you know, might report that, but what we found uh, looking back on that and in that I now know uh, understanding a little bit more about the data systems underpinning everything was uh, our maintenance crews didn't have the ability to, to look at a data historian uh, type of function, uh, functionality on that platform. There was no like black box that was just soaking everything up. Um, that had like some algorithms that was running over their shoulders that could be like, hey, you have some intermittent issues. These systems are flapping. And, uh, and you know, if you take that uh, to its natural conclusion, you can expect to see a catastrophic failure down the road. And knowing that information ahead of time provides uh, the crew, the maintenance personnel and the decision makers, the commanders to uh, make some choices so that they can decide, all right, um, we want to do. 
uh, some predictive or some preventative maintenance, we need to schedule this. When is there the least impact? How do I make appropriate risk and operational and mission decisions? I think that that's the promise of being able to record all this data and put some sophisticated kind of edge computing and analytic uh, capabilities on these platforms is to uh, suss that kind of stuff out, uh, make it human, understandable, readable, and, and pull that not just data back, but information, refine it to a higher level so that the maintainers, um, you know, some of these guys are real experts and they, this is all that they do, uh, especially at the higher uh, end of the NCO scale and our warrant officers and officers, they, they really get this. So empower them to leverage their knowledge and their experience with information coming off the system, empowered by the tremendous potential of the data that exists. Yeah, I mean, it makes so much sense when you tell the story that way. Mitch, in your opinion, do you think that Department of Defense understands the need for this sort of uh, this sort of approach to maintaining assets? Yeah, one hundred percent, Josh. It, you know, even if you look in press recently and uh, recent congressional testimony and on the Hill, you can see that there's a real desire, uh, both from at an executive level and then down into the Department of Defense, that they're yearning for this type of data in order to again increase the operational readiness of their fleets. Uh, it, to to Mike's earlier point, if you just look at a single system of fifth generation fighter as an example, you're seeing on average roughly terabytes of data per flight. And starting to think through how you can truly leverage that data going forward is is an incredible opportunity. You see uh, systems that have been deployed, such as the Alice system for the F-35, is one example. Uh, there's obviously efficiencies to be gained as what's been released on uh, in the press. But at the end of the day, uh, I can tell you uh, with certainty of meeting with many DOD customers that they are, they are asking for this. Uh, they know that the data is available, but really what you're running into in some cases is you have extremely complex systems that are built with multiple uh, input, inputs from OEMs. So you're getting an avionics system from one uh, from one company. The mainframe is being built, or primary uh, airframe is being built by another manufacturer. What you're seeing is uh, uh, various data being generated off the aircraft, but in some cases, the Department of Defense is blocked from being able to uh, view proprietary data from various subsystems on the aircraft. I think what they're asking for, in this case, the Department of Defense, or what they're, they're, they're needing as a requirement is uh, to really a whole of systems view of all of the data being generated across the board and, and starting to correlate between subsystems and the various performance metrics that you're seeing being generated within these missions. Yeah, and I, th I think this like really goes uh, along with uh, an article that recently came out from the, the vice chiefs um, about... Uh, free the data. Um, you know, basically, like the vice chiefs were talking about uh, acquisition and essentially like building in requirements to break down some of these silos. Um, and I think it's it's such a smart, multifaceted approach that the Air Force in particular is taking to this problem because, you know, they're starting to build software factories and bringing in uh, data science and machine learning and software engineering is like a first class of um, capabilities in uniform and in government service so that they have the flexibility to take the data off of their weapon systems that they're flying in combat, right? Um, the idea that they they shouldn't, they the idea that they can't access that data that they're generating in, in a theater of war and then bring that back and do analysis on it, it kind of seems crazy when you think about it that way. Um, but that's kind of, that's kind of where we are. Um, Mike, I mean, given that that's the state of things, um, how do we get from where we are now to what Mitch articulated, uh, you know, about where DOD wants to go? What does that process look like? Yeah. So, you know, acknowledging, just restating what you guys just said, this tremendous value for the data, not just in predictive maintenance, but increasing lethality, increasing, you know, all of these other performance parameters that, you know, a DOD commander cares about, um, what are some of the concerns that need to be addressed moving forward? So one, I think that um, we need to be really clear about where the industry concerns about protecting proprietary information um, meet the needs for an operator and owner and purchaser of a system 
to gather internal information so that they can effectively utilize that system. Uh, just my hot take on this is that you know subsystem functionality developed and designed with private dollars is obviously the intellectual property of the you know manufacturer supplier, right? So I have a LRU or a widget, and I build it, and uh, I write all the code on the inside. I own that. But when that device communicates over a data bus, over an internal network, um, just like when you know my community, you know, computer gets jacked into a, you know an Ethernet LAN and is com- you know com- uh, communicating with other uh, endpoints and other server devices. You know, some of that stuff might have proprietary software on that I can't see into. But I firmly believe that everybody owns the right or the operator owns the right to the data that flows across these internal communications channels because it's a neutral uh, meeting ground. It's an exchange where different vendors uh, bring their, you know, uh, in some cases, proprietary components and other defense cases, government uh, solutions, and they all have to communicate according to a set standard. And that communication standard or language is usually codified in what's called an interface control document. The ICD is normally set um, you know, by the uh, uh, by the program manager, the government entity that you know contracts that system to be built. But even when it is not, um, it's still a neutral playing ground where everybody you know has to know what those uh, languages are, and therefore, um, you know, I, I, f- I feel like that data right there should rightfully be uh, collected and uh, enabled to be utilized by. Uh, the purchaser, owner, operator of a, of a given system. I buy a car, I can tap into the CAN bus, right, that internal data network on my on my car, and I should be able to record all of that, be able to translate all of that inner, uh, uh, you know, inner LRU, inner en- uh, electronic control unit communications, and do with it what I uh, see fit. It's no different than me adding some sensors and, and collecting them, you know, riding along uh, right. my car. Yeah, Mike, I mean, I completely agree. And I think, well, the commercial industry also totally agrees with you. Um, you know, Mitch, we, we talk a lot about um, some of the standards that OEMs in the heavy equipment and manufacturing space use so that they make sure that when they produce a component, a widget, uh, that it knows how to talk to all the other widgets and we don't have 400 different dialects, right? Yeah, absolutely. And agreeing with what Mike said, and, and to your question, uh, there's an opportunity to gain efficiencies across both the commercial and federal markets. And that, and it is, it is, it is. There are common standards uh, that you're seeing on many of this, op- many of these operational technology platforms. You have J1939 or Mill Standard 1553 or on aircraft A rank 429. Uh, what we've started to see is we are capturing and translating a lot of this data is you, you can quickly realize uh, what normal behavior on a platform looks like. And when you start to develop those algorithms and start to uh, work through that data that's being generated on the platform, I can quickly pivot between both a commercial OT platform and a, a federal or, or a weapons platform in some cases. So uh, it is great in the sense of it allows us to decrease engineering time. The standards are the same. Um, and therefore, we're just quickly spinning out capabilities that you're starting to realize across multiple markets. Right. And I mean, I think we talk a lot about assets um, that are already, you know, fleet assets that are already in service now that are going to be in service for decades. It's the same thing in the commercial space and the federal space. You look at the B-52. I don't even know how, like, I think it's older than my parents are, you know. Um, I mean, it's it's been in service for a very, very, very long time. And uh, there's no reason to expect that fleet assets aren't going to continue to have the same sorts of longevity to them. So uh, there are plenty of opportunities for us to look backwards at systems that are already in service, um, start listening to them, start pulling data off of them and help to maintain them so that they continue to be used for, for, for decades. I want to um, spend a moment while we're wrapping up here thinking about future systems. You know, so OEMs have, you know, just like kind of Moore's law predicts on these things, have continued to add digital component after digital component to these systems to the point where you look at an F-35, the thing is a flying supercomputer. As you as you mentioned, Mitch, I mean, it's generating 
tens of terabytes of data for every flight. I mean, just like remarkable amounts of information. Um, Mike, one question to you is, given that we are not really using the data that's already there so effectively, um, and these, these machines are just even making it almost more complicated to analyze because now we're, there's so much more data. What are the challenges going to be for data scientists going forward to try to like build preventive maintenance algorithms on top of these systems? Yeah, I, I think that the current challenge is that a lot of that data um, is not properly enriched. It's not properly labeled. It's not properly normalized. There's a lot of uh, data cleaning that needs to happen often before that data set is in a in a place where you know a data scientist can finally get to work. Um, I think that the opportunities, though, you know, moving forward, are that uh, I hope first and foremost that platform OEMs, that is the you know the big integrators that build and integrate all of the different subsystems to make a complex weapon system, actually take a page out of and look at very successful legacy platforms like the B-52 and the F-16. These are um, older platforms that were built uh, in such a way where they were built on uh, you know, open standards. Um, uh, because the government actually owned most of the intellectual property and was able to share it with all of the vendors, um, and uh, it, you know, there, there was just this tremendous opportunity, and it was relatively easy to... Um, to add and upgrade new systems to these platforms. So I, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a connection to the electronics kind of right to repair movement that I wish that more electronics manufacturers maybe would reconsider their position and appreciate the economic argument that I'm making. That is, if you open the data up, you open the floodgates and you make it easy and accessible to leverage all of this onboard data, you're increasing the stickiness of your capability. You're increasing the expected life uh, expectancy and utilization of your product. And, you know, looking back to the B-52, B-52 and, and F-16 as examples, um, those platforms are around so long, I argue in part because their architectures are so open and it's easy uh, to integrate so many new capabilities. So an innovation ecosystem naturally springs up around them and, um, and the products uh, evolve um, at the speed of, you know, the market and the commercial sense or, at the speed of, uh, you know, the what the warfighter needs in the defense sense. So that's kind of my economic argument uh, wrapped together with, um, you know, what I what I hope to see and, and what I expect. Honestly, that data scientists will benefit moving forward. I I totally agree. I think there's so much that the OEMs can do to really embrace the amazing amount of technological innovation that's happening in fleet and OT today. Mitch, maybe you could wrap up with a comment about. On the government side, you know, the armed services committees, the defense acquisitions uh, professionals that that put these things into um, into the hands of warfighters. What is one thing uh, that that ecosystem could do to make it easier for private in innovators to get the tools and techniques that the warfighters need into their hands? Yeah, great question. Well, I'd first start off by saying. Uh, I think it's uh, our belief for for the three of us that are on this on this call right now is the country uh, as a whole demands this information. Uh, I think they have a right to it because at the end of the day, that is just increasing the readiness of our armed forces and ensuring that we have them at the right place in the right time uh, for our country. So I think there's a national security imperative here in terms of making sure that our fleets are ready uh, when called upon. Um, I, I would actually give a, um, a shout out to innovation organizations such as AFWorks. And as you start to look at some of these things, such as the commercial solutions opening, and you're seeing a similar uh, program starting up with DIU as another example, uh, I think you're starting to see a real push across the government uh, to encourage small tech tech companies such as Shift 5 uh, to think about how we uh, scale solutions in the Department of Defense. Using Shift 5 as an example, uh, we started as a cybersecurity company. Um, we then quickly realized the amount of data that's being generated off of these platforms and the fact that we have access to it can really help in terms of some really critical use cases. 
Um, so I applaud uh, those innovation organizations across uh, the Department of Defense and helping push technology into the Department of Defense. However, um, you're, you're constantly seeing the challenge of small companies who have great solutions. Um, it, the things such as uh, the valley of death within a program or to a program of record is real uh, uh, for small companies and uh, ensuring that the right dollar amounts, particularly in RDT and E as it moves to OEM, uh, is extremely important. If you if it would be interesting to see a study done by either GAO or uh, cong- congressionally or in the Department of Defense on what what the cost of realization is for uh, for every dollar spent on innovation for predictive or conditions based maintenance technology and what it, uh, the cost savings is on the back end for the Department of Defense. I personally think it would shock people uh, on the value of the taxpayer dollars going to this innovation and what it means for the readiness, let alone just uh, it's hard to calculate uh, the value of, uh, of your fleet readiness going forward, if, particularly for the Department of Defense uh, from a national security perspective. Yeah, there are a few things more important than combat readiness, really, when you're talking about the military or, you know, fleet utilization, when you're talking about a revenue generating business, right, Mike? As General Milley used to say when he was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, readiness, readiness, readiness. And his point was that, uh, you know, that that really is the job of the armed services, um, especially during, uh, you know, peacetime. Um, or where we're not engaged in, uh, you know, an active like near peer conflict. Um, the way that we bring security to the world is being ready to bring security to the world. So, uh, you know, that uh, uh, security through deterrence, um, and it's a real thing. I mean, that really does underpin and, uh, and predicate a lot of uh, what we take for granted. So. Readiness, readiness, readiness. Shout out to Joe. Readiness, readiness, readiness. Well, um, guys, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to come on the show. Mike, Mitch, I hope to have you on again really soon. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.